So, hi everyone. Thank you for coming. So tonight we will cover our first lecture on React. And the goal is for you to actually go, go back home with some basic knowledge about React. So I will assume, as I, as I said on the meetup group, that you have a basic knowledge of JavaScript. Uh, and if you have some ES6, that's even better, because we are going to do some ES6 tonight as well. Um, so we are going to build an Airbnb clone with React um, in uh, around one hour and 30 minutes. So basically, what's React? React, in the end, is just JavaScript library that you can use to build HTML views. That's, that's it. And why do we want to, be, to use React? Basically, you may want to use React if your web application has a lot of dynamism on the UI part. Basically, if you're trying to, to build a website like Medium, for instance, where there's a lot of content, you don't really need React. But if you're building something like Airbnb, where you can basically um, search for a city, then filter um, depending on the type of home, etc., etc., having a map that you can drag and drop, and while you drag the map, then the result on, on the left will, will uh, reload, then you may need something powerful on the front-end code. And that's where React will be really, really helpful. Um, so to use React, you, you kind of need to, to have Node.js installed on your computer. Because thanks to Node.js, you're going to be able to download packages on the terminal and use them. In the end, the JavaScript that you write is going to be uh, executed in the browser. Okay, it's going to be executed by Chrome, by Firefox. So the user using your website don't, doesn't need uh, the Node.js. But for building the React application, you need it. So to check if you have Node on your computer, you can open a terminal. And you can run Node-V. And you see I have it. I have version uh, 8.2.1, which is the, the latest. Uh, to install a Node on your computer, if you have a Mac, you can run uh, brew install Node. Of course, you need Brew, but uh, usually if you're a developer, you already have Homebrew installed. And if you want to install it on Linux, uh, it's an apt-get apt -get install. And on Windows, you just go to the, to the website and download it. So we do have Node. So we are ready to, to work with it. And Node is just the engine which can execute JavaScript. You also need another tool, which is a, a, basically a package manager, a dependency manager. There are two main dependency managers in the Node.js ecosystem, which are Yarn and NPM. NPM is the default one, which comes with uh, Node. Uh, but I'm going to use Yarn tonight because that's uh, the, um, uh, that's a package manager which is uh, faster and handles better uh, versions. Also, that's the one that Ruby on Rails chose uh, for the integration in 5.1. So it's just easier for me to use Yarn. But if you want to, to go and have uh, NPM, you, you can do it as well. Once you have the package manager on your computer, you need to install this NPM package, Create React App. This package is something that Facebook um, created. And basically, the goal of this package is to ease the process of creating a new React application. I'm sure that you've already uh, like read a lot of blog posts about React, where people are talking about Webpack, they're talking about Bubble, they're talking about crazy stuff, and you don't really know how to plug everything together so that you can actually start working and start coding on your problem. Create React App is a boilerplate where everything is wired for you, and you don't have to do anything. You just run the command once at the beginning, and then you can start working right away. So, to add the application, you can use the yarn global add command, and then the create, create React app is ready for you. Um, so what, what, do, what do we have in this boilerplate? First, obviously, we have React, okay, the latest version from Facebook. We also have Webpack. Do you know, do you know Webpack? Who knows about Webpack? Raise your hand. Okay, so one person, three, two, three person. So Webpack basically is a tool to bundle your assets together. So w when you are on, on the web and you write JavaScript code, usually what you do you, is you split your code in several JavaScript files. Okay, you don't write all your code in one single file. For performance reasons, when you serve this website 
to your users, you don't want them to download every single file. Because if they download, like, I don't know, like 100 files, it means there are 100 uh, network connections and download from the server, which is really, really slow. So what Webpack does, it compiles every JavaScript uh, file that you need and create a single file, minimified, uh, jzipped, and ready to be served by the browser. So if you know about Rails, basically you have that built in in Rails and it's called the asset pipeline. Okay, so Webpack is just an asset pipeline but for, for Node.js. Then we have ESLint. Do you know ESLint? So ESLint, uh, if, you, if you do Ruby, maybe you know uh, Rubocop. So Rubocop is a tool to check your style and to check your Ruby, Ruby code. ESLint is, is the same, so it's a linter. It's a tool to help you write better JavaScript. Basically, it will check your code every time that you change something, and it will tell you, okay, so line five, you have this kind of error. For instance, if you forgot a space before a parenthesis or this kind of stuff. So ESLint is bundled in the Create React app. This way, you don't have to install it and configure it. And can you guess why ESLint is, is built in into this boilerplate? Why do we have it? Because in the end, it's not really used by the browser. It's not used to actually uh, run in the, in, the, in the user's browser. It's something for developers. To check if, uh, the yeah, basically, it's, it's to check to help you write better code. So ESLint is a tool for the developer, not for the user. We could remove ESLint, and the React application would work the same. And actually, ESLint is not part of the production bundle created by Webpack. Um, but we, we do have it as a default because we actually want to have tools to help us. And then we have Babel. Babel is like one of the scariest package in the JavaScript world because the first time you hear about that, you have no clue what's going on. And basically, that's normal. Don't worry. What Babel does is it simply allows you to write modern JavaScript. You know JavaScript is a language which evolves, which changes. The specification of JavaScript uh, is now at its, at its uh, eighth version, I think. And we, we talk about ES6, we talk about ES5. These, these are versions of JavaScript. And the, the, the version of JavaScript are really hard to change because when you want to implement a new feature in the language, you need every single browser uh, on, on, on the web to actually implement it. It means that Google, Microsoft, Apple, uh, Mozilla, etc., etc. all the vendors need to come together and say, okay, yes, let's implement this feature in JavaScript. And it takes time. Uh, and for instance, you remember maybe about uh, uh, IE6, Internet Explorer 6. It was like, <laughs> now it's 15 years ago, okay? But for, for 10 years, Microsoft basically put a break on the development of, of, the, of the internet, of the web. Because basically they, they didn't want to actually improve their browser. And that's why Firefox um, came in and, and took some market share, and then Google with Chrome came in later. So Babel allows you to actually write modern JavaScript and compile this JavaScript to ES6, which is the modern version of JavaScript that we want to use. So Babel allows you to write ES6 and JSX. So JSX is something that we will see it's a syntax, a templating syntax that we use with React, which allows you to actually write HTML right inside JavaScript code. And it will be useful when you create components. So you see like all these tools, and that, that's the, the, I mean the, the main tools, because in the boilerplate code, you have more. If you were to start from scratch and create a new Node project and add React, add Webpack, add ESLint, add Babel, etc., etc., and wire everything together, basically it takes you a week because it never works, okay? And that's why we don't want to spend time on this, so we just take what Facebook configured for us and go from there. For Power users, when, once you understand what you're doing, there is a command which is called eject, like a seat eject in the plane, if you want where basically you, you go out of the boilerplate and then you can configure everything by hand. But by default, you will see there, are, there is uh, really a, 
a few lines of code to actually use the boilerplate. So let's actually create a new React app using this tool. So I will go to this folder where I will create my new application. Then I will run the create React app command. So create React app. And I will name it Airbnb clone. That's what we want to build tonight. And now it's going to, to take around 20 seconds. So basically it will download from the internet packages which are needed by the boilerplate to actually uh, run and install everything uh, in my folder. So once uh, this is done, we are, we are going to go inside the folder we just created and launch the command yarn start. Yarn start is a command which will actually run the server locally on your computer and you will be able to go in your browser and inspect your web application. So it's done. So you see, we have some help right after the, the, the tool. So you have yarn start, yarn build, yarn test, yarn eject. Okay, so don't run yarn eject. I mean, not tonight, because basically it will create a big project where you can configure everything. Uh, we are going to use yarn start to start the development server. So first, let me just open the project in Sublime Text. Ah, sorry. So let's go into the, the project, open it in Sublime Text and launch yarn start. Okay, starting the development server. The development server should be running on the port 3000. Yeah, okay, so if you see this, it means that basically you manage to install the boilerplate and run the React application. Okay, so that's a small victory to start with. What do we have in the project? Basically, if you look at the structure, you have uh, two folders, one folder which is the public folder and one folder which is SRC folder. In the public folder, you will have stuff like assets, like images, like uh, the favicon, etc. In the SRC, you will have all the JavaScript code for your components. And at the root of the project, you have some configuration files. So let's, let's have a look in Sublime. If you look at the public uh, index.html file, this is some HTML. So you know HTML, okay? So you recognize the HTML opening tag, the head, the body, okay? And what do we have in the body? I mean, is it a big body? Are you used to this kind of body? Is, is it like a small, a big, a big one? When you write HTML, <coughs> you think it's big? No, it's, it's small. Yeah, it's small. It's really small. I mean, there's nothing, there's right? No yeah, yeah, there's nothing. There's just like a no script tag and a div tag, and that's it. So basically, if you open this file in the browser, it's just blank. Okay, there's no content, nothing. And so this, this. Um, elements will show up if the browser does not support JavaScript or if the user disabled JavaScript. Okay, so it means that basically when we build a React application, we have to run JavaScript on the browser. That's mandatory. Okay, so that's one limitation of React actually. If you want to serve content to the most users, you don't want JavaScript in the way. You just want to serve HTML. So here we are going to, to build an application where we say, okay, we need JavaScript. And if you don't have JavaScript, you, I'm sorry, but you can't use my application. So there's a no script saying that. And then we have a div with an ID root, and this div is empty. And the goal of React will be to actually build HTML elements and inject them into this div element. Okay, so all the HTML you will see tonight we will be built by JavaScript and not because I write some JavaScript code in an HTML file. Okay? So I'm going to, to show this file just once because now we don't need it. We just, need, we just have to know that basically we have a div with an ID root and that's it. And then now if you, if you look at the index.js, which is the file which is loaded uh, by the index.html, you have some code, 
And here you have stuff that you are not really used to when you do just plain JavaScript with jQuery in your, in your development life. You have import stuff in here. So basically this is something that uh, Webpack will uh, help you with. Basically, you will say, okay, in this file, I need React. So I will import React to be able to use it inside my application. Also, I need some CSS. Here, it's kind of a weird way to actually require your CSS into your project. Because what do you do when you want to put some CSS on your web page, usually? You go in, in your HTML file, you go in the head, and you add a link, right? So here, when you use Webpack, what you can do is actually import CSS right from JavaScript. And one advantage of doing that is actually have automatically, uh, automatic reload in your project, meaning that when you change a CSS, you can have your, your text editor on the left, your browser on the right, and it will update as soon as you save uh, the CSS changes. So you don't have to go back and forth between the text editor and the browser and reload. It does that for you. So that's kind of nice. Um, and here, so we are going to import external libraries. So React, React DOM, which is stuff we need uh, for, for React. Here, that's, that will be index.css. What does dot slash mean? Do you know what the dot slash mean? What's dot in Unix? Yeah, current folder. So basically, importing dot slash index.css means import the file name index.css, which is at the same level as myself. So it will be this file, index.css. OK? Uh, same for this, but here we are going to require some um, JavaScript, app.js. We can just disable this. I mean, I won't talk about that tonight. And then the most important line is this one. What if I comment this line out? I just comment it out, and I go back to Chrome. What do I have? I have a blank page. <coughs> Look. So if I, if I just put back, back the, the code and I save, as soon as I save, the browser will reload on the left. So you see, I just saved my changes in Sublime Text, and I didn't touch the browser. I didn't go back to the browser and hit refresh. It just refreshed, refreshed by itself. And if we look at the console, actually, we should have some, some messages. OK? So basically, when you use Webpack, you have this nice feature where you can code, stay in your code, and if you have an external screen, you just put your browser in the external screen, and you don't touch it. Okay, you just look at what happens. So that's really nice for productivity. Okay, great. So here what we render is app.js, which is something that the boilerplate gives us, but we don't really want it. Okay, so we are not going to use this application. It's just here to show you that basically it worked. So what are we going to do now? Basically, we, we would like to actually write our first component. React is all about creating components. A component is a small part of a UI that you can reuse and that you can isolate. So basically, when you look at, a, an, at an application, you can, you can figure out the components. If you take Airbnb, for instance, Airbnb on the left, you have a list of flats. Each flat will be a component. So we will create a component for the flat. We will also create a component for the map, etc., etc. So let's see how we create a component and start by creating a really, really simple one, which is a component which will just display text. So first, I won't put everything in the same folder. I just create a, a nice components folder, and I will create a hello.js file in this folder. And in this file, we will create our first component. So how do we do that? So let me first create the folder, and create the file. So in Sublime Text, now I have a hello.js file, which is empty. And that's the file I want to actually create. So several steps. First, into this component file, we need to import React. So we will import the React uh, class from the React package. This is how you read it. So React will be something that we are now be able to use starting at line two. Then you define a component, and a component will be a class. So the class keyword in JavaScript exists since ES6. If you just write ES5, if you, if you write regular JavaScript code, you don't have the class keyword. 
And the class keyword actually does not work in Internet Explorer 8, for instance. Thanks to Webpack and Babel, you can write this kind of code, and in the end, it gets compiled to code that can actually run in Internet Explorer. So we write this, and here we have a nice definition. So if you know about object-oriented programming, you kind of understand what's happening. So we define a class, hello, which extends the React.component class. So it's object inheritance in here, like in Java, like in Ruby. Then we define a method inside the class, which is a render method. A component, the minimum component that you can create is this. It's a class with a single method, render. And what should render do? Can you guess what it should do, the method? What's the goal of, of the render method? Yeah, basically create a string, some HTML, and return this. Okay? So basically you, have, you will have components which are nested inside other components, etc. And you create HTML at every leaf of the tree and return everything and at the end React will build the web page for you. So the goal of a component is to have a render method and return some HTML inside this render method. That's the goal. Okay? So let's actually see what we can do to return some HTML, and this is what we can do. We can return this. And you see, I, I said return a string, return HTML. Do you see some string, some JavaScript string, like line five? Do you see like the double quote, single quote, etc.? So what is that? Is it valid JavaScript? Not really. This is GSX. Okay, that's the templating language that React uses to actually express HTML right inside the components. Which is really handy because you don't have to basically concatenate strings and interpolate strings, etc. Et Just write plain HTML and you will see there are some tweaks to do on the HTML code so that it actually works. Because for instance, you see that it's class. Class is a reserved keyword in JavaScript. But in HTML, what is class? That's an attribute and an element to apply CSS, right? So there's, there's kind of a conflict. So for this kind of conflicts, uh, JSX provides a solution, and, and I will talk about that later. So here we have a component which implements the render method and returns some HTML thanks to the JSX syntax. And the G HTML we return is just a div with some text in it. That's it. We are not done yet. There's a last step, and this is line 9, where you have to export the hello class that you created. So that's something which is also new if you don't know about Webpack. I mean, if you just do JavaScript in the browser, you just create files and require them in the HTML, everything is available by default. When you define a function in a JavaScript file, it's there. It's there for other files to use. The only thing you need to make sure is that uh, the order in which you require the JavaScript files has to be uh, compatible with the way you use the function. So that's kind of tricky. For instance, if you use jQuery in the JavaScript file, if you import jQuery after this file, you will have an error. And I'm sure you already have the error. Dollar uh, is not defined. You already had this error. So Webpack, basically what you do is you define the files, and you will export. You will uh, say, OK, in this file, I want other files to be able to use the hello class. Because here we could, we could have defined other methods, other classes, and you would say, OK, this is private, this is just for my file, and the hello class can be used by other components. That's why we need this line, export default hello. And once you have that, basically you can use this component elsewhere. So let's actually write it again. So I told you we need to import React from React. Then we can define the class hello, which will extend the react.component. And the render method will implement a little div. And in the end, we just export hello. OK, so now my component is ready to be used. How can I use my component? Where should I use it? Did 
continue guess. So basically, there is a root JavaScript file which, which gets executed by, uh, by the browser, which is index.js. And in index.js, basically, what we are going to do is import our component. It got exported before, so now we can import it. So import hello from and the path to the JavaScript file. And then we can React DOM render this component in the app. OK, so change the line 7 so that instead of saying app, it says hello, look. If we go back to the index.js. So here we import the app component from the app.js file. I can show you the app.js file now. This is a class which extends the React component. So this is another way of actually writing it. Okay, you can import React and component so that you can skip the prefix in here. And in the end, you just export the component. So app is a component that the boilerplate gave us. Fine. But here we don't want to render app. We want to render which component? Hello. Right. So we want to, to write this. Okay? But if we just do it like that, we have a, an error. Why? Basically, it tells you, okay, hello is not defined. Okay, so hello is not defined. Why? Did we import hello yet? No. So we are going to do it. Import hello from, and where is it from index.js? So index.js in here, in SRC. So where is the component? Inside the component subfolder. So the path should be components slash hello. Okay, so now I import the component from my file. I save, and now it reloads and displays the hello component. Okay, so that's at the top left, really tiny. So now I can go back and forth between the app and the hello. And just changing the line 8 in my index.js file, I choose whatever component I want to mount into my web page. OK? So your goal is to now create components and map them together. We're going to combine them, you'll see. And make sure you can actually use them into a main file where it will inject the HTML created by React. And if we look, if we look at the source code, if we look at the source code, you see my div with the ID root. That's the one we had before in the index.html. And it was empty in our source code, right? And here now, what does it have? It has a div, hello, which comes from the rendering from React. OK? So the role flow, again, is to actually create a class. This class has to have a render method and needs to return some HTML, thanks to JSX. We need to make sure this class is available for other files to import. Then, in our main file, we can write, we can import this, this component and render it thanks to this line. And actually, if you go to the end of the file, you see the render method in React DOM takes some JSX plus takes the element, the DOM element in which we want to inject the component. OK, so you have the document get element by ID root in here, which is really important. If you change this to, I don't know, test, it's not working anymore. It can't work because TST, the ID TST does not exist. So what you could have is actually having several elements in the HTML with several ID, IDs and mounting several components at different places of your page. That's something possible. And that's something which is really nice about React because it means that you can take an existing web website, put React, and say, OK, in this div, in this empty div, I will use React to build a UI component and leave the rest of your page uh, as is. That's a really great feature of React. It means that you can actually decide after, I don't know, like five years of development on your project. You say, okay, now I want to use React in my project because I have heavy UI, I have a lot of dynamism, and I, I can't stand jQuery anymore, and the, the code is too much spaghetti. So I need to put React. But you don't have to throw everything away. You can just put React, and for small parts of the application, start implementing stuff 
with this library. And that's something which is really powerful. Because if you take a library like Angular, for instance, you can't really do this. Basically, when you choose Angular, it's kind of like the old code, old code has to go away. And you have to start from scratch again. With React, you can do it incrementally, which is really important. OK, so um, now we have a component, but the component is kind of dumb. OK, it's just rendering text. We would like it to actually render uh, stuff which depends on variables. We want to have, in the end, we want to put some JavaScript like uh, if conditions or variables, etc. We want to inject some properties to a component. So the way to do that in React is called props. Props is something that you can use in a React component to inject some dynamic uh, variables. You can think of that like uh, instance variables in a class. If you take a Ruby class, for instance, and, and you, you, you have the initialize method, and you can pass arguments to the method, and you can store this into instance variables. You have that in Java as well. You have that in C++. I mean, in any object-oriented programming uh, language, you, you can do that. So here in React, the way you do it is you use the, the this keyword. This refers to the current uh, instance of the hello class that you are using. And you can access this dot props dot something. And the dot something is whatever you want. OK, so here we, we're going to say, OK, my component now needs to be passed a name so that it can render correctly. So you say, OK, I will use this name in the render. And we'll see how we call that, actually. So look, let's take the hello component. Hello this dot props dot name. Um, so now, if we look at the code, it says hello, but uh, hello nobody, I mean there's nothing. So the way we pass information to the components will be like that. Let's say hello to Boris. And you see on the left on, on, on Chrome, it's working. Okay, so here, I'm passing props to a React component thanks to this syntax. So after the component name, I will put a key and a value. The key will be uh, the props, and the value will be whatever I want to store in these props. And you see it kind of looks like HTML, right? I mean, in HTML, you do that for IDs, classes, um, values on inputs, etc. So here, you create kind of custom HTML elements, which are React components and you pass whatever information that you need to them. OK? So here I passed a string, but I could have passed a number, a JavaScript object, a function, whatever I want. To begin with, a string is easier to understand. And I can, I, I can, I can, sorry, I can pass more than just one. If I want to pass first name and last name, I will do something like that. OK? So I'm passing information. How can I use that in the component now? <coughs> yeah, so here that would be first name, and here that would be last name. OK? I'm using two params. And you see that in JSX, the way you do interpolation, the way you use JavaScript code inside the HTML, is thanks to the curly braces. OK, because if you remove the curly braces, I mean, let's remove just this part, it will say hello this.prop.firstName, obviously. That's the text. It does not get executed. OK, so you need the curly braces to actually say, yes, yeah, this is some, some JavaScript. So here, when you do that, it's the equivalent of saying, create a new instance of the class hello, and pass it to the render method. What I, what I could have, I could do that, if I want. OK? You see on the left, it's still working. Basically, I take my, J my JSX code, I create a new instance of the hello component with first name and last name as props. And I, and I store this into the root variable, 
and I pass the root variable to the render method. Okay? So you can create several instances. Here I'm just creating one component, but you could have a div with several hello in, in it if you want. I mean, we you can do it right away if you want. Let's build some more complex HTML. Let's say hello to Roman as well. So for this JSX, if you see on the left, now we have two lines. So we instantiated two, um, two elements of the class hello with different props. And it works exactly the same as, uh, again, Ruby, Python, C++, whatever language that you use for object-oriented programming. Because that's the same idea. Do you know const? If you did some ES6, maybe it's new for you. So how do you define in ES5 a variable? You just say var, space, the name of the variable, right? So with ES6, we, don't, we can still use var if you want, but we have two new keywords which are kind of handy. We have const and let. Const is the one you want to use for a variable that you don't want to reassign. That won't change. And let is for a variable that will change. Okay, so here I use const because after in the code, I'm not saying uh, root equal again. I'm not reassigning the, the value of, of, the, of the root variable. Okay. So, <coughs> this is props. This is how you pass information to a component and how you use it in the render method to change the display. And that this is how you actually build an object, an object that you can reuse uh, in your UI. So now that you have like the basics of React, like how you create a component, how you instantiate a component, how you pass information, let's actually build the Airbnb clone. So this is what we want to build, and I hope we have time and we don't finish too late. So basically, before you actually dive in into the code and React, you need some some planning. You need to figure out where are the components. What are the components in this page? There are four components that we can find and we are going to implement. So, can you name some? <coughs> so yes, there's a map, so that's one component. Yeah, the search bar. We'll see if we create a component especially for that, but that could be a, a component. You're right. Yeah, the card for the flats. Okay, and actually that's where um, the concept of classes, instances really shines because you actually reuse the same component six times for six flats. Okay, so your goal is just to build one card with the picture and the name underneath, and then you're going to reuse this code to build the list. Okay, so we have a flat component. Sorry? Yeah, you have markers you can put on the map, okay? Because we want to link, basically, um, a flat with a marker. So the, what we want to achieve is when you click on a picture, the map will move and center on the address of the flat you just clicked. And also, we, we would like to apply some CSS so that you see there is a marker which is on the yellow background, and all the other markers are white. And that's what we want to, to have, some dynamism. So when I click on a flat, the map moves and the marker changes. Uh, okay, so markers, flat, map, and there is a, the last component that you always forget in the beginning. That's the main container, the app. You need to put everything inside something. Okay, and that will be called the app. Okay, so in the app, we will have on the left, uh, the search bar and the flat, and on the right, uh, the map. Okay? So that's our component. So once you've identified the components, you have to name them. So here it's not that hard, okay? You just take uh, the name of the visual component that you have, but sometimes it takes more time to actually figure out the names. So we will create the, the app, the flat, the map, and the marker. Okay, so let's start with the flat. So for the flat, this is like the skeleton of the HTML I want to generate. Okay, I have this element, so it's a div. Okay, and I have two parts of this div. First, I have the picture, and then I have a title. 
There are many ways of actually implementing this. Uh, the way I choose is to actually create a div with, with a fixed height and putting the picture as a background image. This way, no matter the size of the background image, you, you just use a background size cover in CSS and it will fit nicely. Okay, you won't have resizing problems, you won't have ratio problems. So we put a div and we are going to inject a style with a background image, some CSS. And for the flat title, so the part underneath, it's just some text. Okay, so we will put the price, the price tag, and the name of the apartment. Okay? So, let's actually uh, build it. So first, I will create a new, a new fly, flat.js, <coughs> and I will create my new component. So you remember now, we need to import React first. And then we need to define the class and extend React component. The component needs to have a render method, which returns some HTML. And here, I will use parentheses because it will be a bigger component with more HTML and more lines. Okay, so you just put uh, every JSX code inside the parentheses. And in the end, what should I do before we actually dive into the render method? Exporting the flat. Okay, cool. So, my flat. I have a div which contains two div. Okay? The first div, we can put a flat class. So how do we put a class on the HTML element? You just do that. Okay? But that's HTML. And here we are not really doing HTML. It looks like it, but we are doing JSX. So here, as class is a reserved keyword of JavaScript, you can't use class directly. And can you guess what we do in here? I mean, engineers had to come with an ID, so maybe you can guess it. This. Sorry? This? This? This dot class. So it's not that. Let's still guess. You could have class with a K. That's a <laughs> classical one. But that's not this one. But actually, in Java, you have that everywhere. So that's something which is called a class name. So in JSX, you can't use class directly. If you put class, I mean, you won't have an error. It just won't apply the CSS classes that you want. And you, have, you will have weird bugs. So anyway, you just use class name. So we have a class name for flat, a class name for the flat um, picture, thanks, and the class name for the flat title. And we know that we want to inject some CSS, so what we can do is create a file for this component, a flat.css file. My flat.css file will have some code for the flat, some code for the flat picture, and some code for the flat title. And the way I import this CSS file into my components will be thanks to Webpack with this. Okay, so I have a JavaScript file for my component and I create a CSS file where I will put the style for this component. It's kind of different from the way you are used to if you do web development, where usually we kind of separate completely the JavaScript, HTML and CSS. So here with React and Webpack, uh, you are encouraged to actually build components wi which are self-sufficient, which basically import their style with themselves. Okay? So here we are going to follow this, this practice. Okay, so we have a flat, a flat picture, and a flat title. Cool. Um, so what else? What should I do now? Because right now, uh, the div is kind of empty. So what, how do we create the content? So let's start with the title. That's the easiest part. What should I put in here? So what do we need? We need information, right? We need to fetch information from somewhere. So how do you pass in React information to a component? We use props, OK? So we, we, we need to assume that we are going to get some props from the external world. 
Okay, and here, that's the time that we actually choose what information that we need. Okay, so here, I know I want to be the title. Okay, so I need to have this, like a, a variable title, and I need to fetch information from uh, the external world thanks to props. So the title will be what? We said price plus, plus what? The name of the flat. Okay? This is just pseudocode, okay? It's not the real implementation. So the price comes from the props. So we need these, those props, dot something. But we will see that basically fetching information from the external world would be easy to, to, to have if you, if you get a JavaScript object, a JSON. What we are going to use is something from the external world, where the JSON could, could, sorry, where the JSON could come from. We need a JSON, we need information to actually render the flats. So when we have, where do we have JSON usually? Yeah, from a web service, from an API. <laughs> okay, we need to assume that when you build a React application, you connect at some point to an API which fetches information in JSON format. So here, we, are, we, are, we don't have an Airbnb API. I mean, they announced today that they released it, but it's like, a, it's, I mean, you can't go on the Airbnb website and sign up. You have to go through a Google form and they need to approve you. So here, I just created a fake like a very fake API, which is just a JSON file on GitHub, which contains information about flats. So this is the information that we will get from the external world to render our flats. And you will see, you, you see this is a flat. So we get a name, an image URL, a price, and a price currency. Okay, so we need to assume that the props that we are going to get looks like it. We're going to get a flat, which contains a name, a price and an image URL keys. So let's build against this assumption. So we are going to get this dot props dot flat dot something name. And why do we know that? Because we know that at some point when we render the component, it will look like that. Okay, we know that in the parent, somewhere, we are going to have objects containing information about flats, which are passed to the component like that. So we are passing a single prop, which is flat, which contains everything we need. That's one way of doing it. What could be the other way? Sorry? Yeah, you could pass every single key as a separate props. You could pass flat name equal blah, 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 price equal, etc. Here, I kind of like to keep it together. Okay, I'm just passing everything I need to know about the flat. This way, if we add more information later, it's already there for us to use. And actually, it fits the API nicely as well. So we know that. So now we can build the title. So what will be the title? Basically, that will be this.props.flat.name plus this.props.flat, I'm oh sorry, price first, dot name. Okay? So are we done for the title? The yeah, we are missing the currency. So we should add it. So that's price currency. And what else? Like right now, everything is like stuck together. We need some spacing, right? So what you could do is have something like that. Okay. So here, I'm going to stick with this really ugly implementation of concatenation of strings uh, because at, at least it's simple to understand for you. Okay. And if we have time later, I'm going to like explode everything uh, and, and put a nice implementation of that. Because in ES6, what you have is called template literals, which is a way to interpolate some JavaScript inside the string 
so that you don't have to plus everywhere. But at least for now, let's, let's stick it that way. Okay? Cool. So we have the title. Um, what else do we need to do in this component? The picture. Okay? And I told you that for the picture, I wanted to implement a dynamic background image. So how do you do a dynamic background image in HTML and CSS? How do you inject CSS into a single HTML element? Use a style. Okay? So we're going to, to inject some style, like that. And when you do HTML, style is just a string. It's just a bunch of uh, CSS uh, properties, which are uh, one next to each other, okay, with a semicolon. When you do React, the way you pass some style to component will be thanks to uh, an object. And it will look like CSS, actually. So you will have keys and values for the style you want to inject. And here, what do you... What property, what CSS property do we want to use to inject a background image? <coughs> background image, okay? So that's CSS, at least it's simple. But how do you write background image for CSS? That's this way. But here, you're kind of stuck because you are using keys for JSON. You're in JavaScript. So every time you have a CSS property which contains a dash, you have to change it to this. So you remove the dash and you uppercase the next letter. That's how you build the CSS properties in React. Okay, because you can't use dash in keys in the JSON. So the background image will be what? That would be a URL, okay. And what do I put, sorry. What do I put in here? Yeah, you see the image URL will come from the props in the flats. So that will be this.props.flat.image URL. Are we done? So you see URL this.props.flat.image URL is inside a quote. It's, it's a string. Okay, it's not JavaScript, it's not interpolated. So the way you do that, one way, let's stick to the ugly way, will be this. Okay, so you have a, a piece of string plus your URL plus another piece of string. And it's, it works, actually. Now, let's actually use modern JavaScript and how you will do that. Basically, instead of doing what I just did, you will say backtick instead of the, of the quote, and interpolate inside a dollar curly brace the JavaScript code you want. So this is a string with the back ticks, containings of JavaScript code executed inside the curly braces. And you need the dollar. So this syntax, actually if you do Ruby, it's really close from the way we do that in Ruby, interpolation in Ruby, because in Ruby you use double quotes, and you use the, the, the hashtag sign and curly brace. So here you just replace the double quotes with back tick and the hash with the dollar. Okay? If you're not comfortable with this, just stick to the plus signs and otherwise go on the documentation. It's called template iterals. Okay? So you just Google that template iterals ES6 and play a bit with it. Once you, you get it, you can't go back. You can't go back to just plusing everything. Okay, so now we have our component uh, with the style. Uh, you have a yeah, exactly. So right now the div, its height is zero because there's no content. So we are going to need to change the CSS for the flat picture. So the flat picture has to have um, a fixed height. So here it would be 200, okay? Just an arbitrary uh, number. Great, so uh, let's render this in the browser, okay, because right now we don't have any visual feedback. And uh, once we have the visual feedback, we can tweak a bit the CSS. How do I use this 
component. Yeah, exactly. OK, I have to go back to my index.js. And actually, I won't do it right in index.js. I will use the app. OK, so I will go back to whatever uh, the application gave me, the boilerplate gave me, which, which was this. So importing an app and rendering the app. OK, and inside the app component, I will use my flat. OK, so now I can close the index.js. I, I won't have to open it again. So you see, I went back to the previous boilerplate. OK, so let's go back to the app.js. So here I get, in the app.js, I get a, a logo that I don't want and some HTML. Cool. So here, I want to use the flat. I want to do that. OK, so I need to do two things before this code actually runs, because right now you have an error. OK? First, I need to import the flat component. Because I can't use the component in this uh, file if I didn't import it. So let's import this. Import. Sorry. Flat from. Uh, so. Components flat. OK, so now flat is defined. Flat is not defined. Line 10. So this is not defined. So this is a variable which is not yet defined, so I need to create this variable like that, OK? And here what I can do is just pass whatever information I will fetch from the JSON later. So this is my flat, actually, OK? This is the inform we will see how we actually do an AJAX request and fetch information. But here I can just copy-paste the information, OK? So that's just a, a JSON with a name, image URL, price, and some latitude and longitude. And now if I go back to my uh, component, you see it's working. Okay, it's <laughs> right now it's ugly, but at least I, I get some information. So I get my picture with the 200 pixels, and I get the title. OK? So let's do some CSS right away. First, what you want to do is uh, basically uh, have the background size cover. This way, you see the card will uh, resize <coughs> automatically. OK? What you can do as well is, is have a background position, center, so that the picture will center automatically depending on, on the size of the div. OK? How could we fix the fact that when I extend the window, Everything goes 100%. Uh, what, could, what could I do? Should I solve it right away? Because here, what I want to do is actually fit these cards in a grid. OK, so I, I want to build a grid, but the grid is something outside the component. So I should not fix this kind of like uh, y, uh, width issue uh, before actually having a grid. So let's wait for having a grid before we fix that. I could put some margin for the title because right now it's stuck to the image. So if we go back to the flat title, I can add some margin, like 10 pixels, for instance. And this way, and I can put some, uh, some bold as well. Um, I mean, I won't change the font tonight, but the idea is like uh, Arial or Helvetica, I don't remember the default one, is uh, not that good. So you could change for a lighter font. Anyway, it's not a design course. So, we have some CSS for the flat, and now what we want to do is actually make sure that we can render several flat flats. How can I render our second flat? Yeah, before actually fetching information, can we just render our second one? I mean, even with the same information to see if it's working? Let's do that. Let's just render our second flat. Yeah, I have two flats. OK? So before we, we, we fetch a real database, we can go on with the implementation, putting several flats. OK, even if it's the same flat, we don't really care. And we can fix the layout, and we can fix the grid. So let's now dive in into actually making this look a bit more like Airbnb. So we are going to use flex boxes. So flex boxes are 
great CSS uh, techniques that came um, a few years ago. I mean, it's quite advanced and quite new. Um, so the way we use Flexbox is to actually uh, define some divs and say, OK, inside the Flexbox, my elements will automatically size depending on some rules. And here, so we're, what we're going to do is have an app, which is a Flexbox, containing a main and a map. The main will be on the left. The map will be on the right. And inside the main, we will have a search bar and our flats. OK, so you kind of draw some squares which fit, uh, which look like the, the Z squares. OK, so on the right, you have an element. On the left, you have the list. And we are going to use Flexbox to have a design which looks like that. So if we go back to, um, to our code, and we f if we just take this, so actually, I will, I will remove my flats for now. So we take this, we put our class name so that it works in React. And I will explain this code for the Flexbox in a second. OK. <coughs> so the, the main app will be a Flexbox. The main will take 60% of the width. <coughs> this is needed for the flats. I will uh, detail this later. And the map will take the space remaining. OK, so 40%. The, the height of the map will be 100VH. VH means viewport height. It means that it will take the whole height of the window. OK? And then I have, I have a top zero and position sticky. Position, position sticky is nice because I will be able to scroll the flats and I have the map uh, not moving. OK, I don't want to move to scroll the map when I scroll the, the, the flats. OK, so this. If I go back to the browser, I don't see anything. So to check that it actually worked, what I can do is put some ugly color on the divs. So let's say on the left, I put the red. And on the right, I put the green. OK. And you see, we have the flexbox working. OK. When you resize, you have the 60-40% ratio, which is working. And if I change that to 80, for instance, uh, it's working as well. OK, so that's how you will balance the flat list and the map. So let's stick to 60. Cool. Um, so that's for the main layout. Now, if we dive in into the, the flats, inside the flats, you will have several flats. And those flats are also flexbox. And what we do is that basically this flexbox should span on multiple walls. That's why we need the flex wrap property. And we will stick everything at the top, meaning that if we just have three flats, we don't want to center on the page vertically. We want them to go up. That's why we need the align content flex start. And each card will take 50% of uh, the, the space of the flexbox. This means that with 50%, you have two cards per line. And that's how we build the grid. So look. If I put this into my app.css and <coughs> this in the flat, flat.css, OK, cool. Uh, so still nothing, because right now, in my app.js, my flat is empty. OK, so how, how do I add flat? Basically, I just render the component flat. And if I reload, now I get my flats in a nice grid. OK? It's working. So actually, uh, for the flats, if we just do like fl uh, flex basis 50%, Everything is stuck together, you see? So it's not really nice. So what we want to do is have a margin, OK, 10 pixels, so that you have margin around the flex. But now 50% is too much, because you have 50% plus 10 pixels. So it does not fit in 100%. So the way we make it fit, we say it's not 50%. It's not uh, 49, and you reload until it's, uh, you know, you don't do that, OK? You just say, OK, that's 50%. minus 20 pixels. 
Why 20 pixels? Because you have 10 on the left, 10 on the right, and automatically the browser will compute the right dimension for the width. And this way you have a nice green. Okay? So let's remove the red and let's remove the green. We don't really need them. It's not this one, this one. Okay, and actually we can put one more flat to have an odd number. So in app.js, I can put a third flat and you will see the, the map is still working. Okay, so now I have a grid. I have my components and you see I didn't touch the CSS of my component. I just created a grid thanks to Flexbox and my flat fit nicely in the grid. Okay? Cool. So, we're going to talk about React State. State is a bit like the cousin of props. And state is for information inside a component which will change during the lifetime of a component. And some stuff actually never change in a component. That's the stuff we use for props. For instance, uh, here, Inside the flat, the background picture does not change, so it's a prop. But for the main application, the list of flats will change. So for the app, the list of flats is something which is mutable, meaning that you can change it. And we change it when you scroll the map, we change it when you search, etc., etc. So we, we are going to implement some state into the app. Before we do that, let's actually fake the state. So here you see I have the flats. I can refactor this code into a loop. I can say, okay, I have an array of flats which contain three times the same flat. I mean, obviously, flats will fetch information from the API at some point, but still, I have my array, JavaScript array, containing my flats. So in here, instead of repeating this code, I can use some JavaScript to loop. Do you know the modern way on looping on an array in JavaScript? You can do for each, okay, which is really close from the ruby.each code. Here we won't do for each exactly, we will do map. Map is a method which takes a function, which takes a callback, and basically will, for every element in an array, return whatever transformation you do with this uh, element in the array. So here we do map and we pass a callback to a function which will contain every element. And the goal of this function is to actually return, return what? We are going to build stuff, some HTML. So return some JSX. So here we are going to return a new flat. Okay, uh, so it's not working. Yeah, because that's not this, that's just flat. Okay, so you see it's still working. If I add a fourth flat like that, I get my fourth flat, okay, if I just have two. So you see now the code below in the return does not depend on the size of the flats array which is what we want, because we want to actually dynamically pass a list of flats. So now the code will run nicely and do whatever we want. There's another way of writing this function using uh, a new ES6 feature, feature, which is called the fat arrow. It's called like that because it looks like a fat arrow. Okay. So basically you just remove the function, you keep the argument into parentheses, and you, you put equal and a greater than sign. And it still works. Okay, so that's a more concise way of writing a, a callback. Uh, and it also has some nice pro properties with this. I will go back to that later. Okay, cool. Um, so we have our list of flats. And now, yeah, I wanted to talk about the state. Okay, so we know that this is going to change uh, depending on the search we do or the actions we do on the map. So the way we introduce the state in a component is like this. Basically, you will add an explicit constructor, which is 
like an initialize function in Ruby, to your component. So constructor will take some props, then you will call the super props method, passing the props to your parent, to the React component class, and that, then you will define the state of the component, and you will define how the state is initialized. Here, for the app component, we know that we need a list of flats. That's why we define the state containing the key flats and starting with an empty array, because in, in the beginning, we don't have any information. So let's actually add this function to the app. OK. So we start by making sure that React still works, thanks to this line. And then we define the list of flats. Having done that, how can we change the return method so that it uses the, the, the flats in the state rather than what we define in the render method? Basically, we want to get rid of this. And here we just add the this, that state. So now the map will use whatever information contained in the component uh, and render this. So if I go back to Chrome, my page is blank again. Why? Yeah, because this the state that flats is empty. And there's nowhere in the code that actually fill this information. OK? And that, how could I get this information? Well, now it's the time to actually go and fetch the JSON from my boilerplate, okay, from what I give you. But obviously, you have an API, you have information, and you call this API, and you get a JSON. And that's how you instantiate information into your components. OK, here I'm just faking the API part. So how do you call um, external resources right from JavaScript. Basically, in modern JavaScript, again, in modern browsers, you can call fetch. Fetch is a function which takes a URL, at an argument, and returns something which is called a promise. I won't detail what it's about, but basically, thanks to what fetch returns, you can chain dend. You can do dot .den, dot .den, dot .den. And basically, here for dot .den, we will say, OK, I get a response. This is a JSON. I transform it to a JSON object. And after that, in the callback, I will be able to change the state and take the information I get from the API and assign it to the component state. This is the whole loop I want to do. And this, this code needs to go somewhere. And you have the answer right here. It goes into a method which is called component did mount which is a special function which is called by React when a component is ready uh, to be displayed in the browser. So component did mount is called automatically by React. You don't have to call it. And it will run the code that you provide to React. So let's actually implement this. So I, I need this function. And first, what we can do, oh, actually, sorry, did mount. There's also the will mount, which is for something else. Anyway, so here I will just log did mount, and we will check that in the console we get the message. OK? So we, you see, did mount is called. I did not explicitly call the function, React did it for me. Cool. But here I want to fetch. I want to fetch, and I need a URL to fetch. Well, let's go back to the boilerplate. And on the GitHub page, I can fetch this JSON. OK, this is my URL, which is a bit long, which contains the JSON. So I fetch this. Then I need to do this little tweak. Sorry, uh, no, it's response. The JSON to convert the raw string I get from the request uh, to JSON. So here, actually, we are doing AJAX. Okay, That's the modern way of doing it. And here, I get a callback. And I will just log the data I get from the API, from the fake API. Okay, So this is a function Okay, using the fat arrow. If I reload the page, sorry, if I save, 
here. So if we go to the network tab, you see that basically flat.json was called. So the request went through. And in the callback, we are displaying the JSON we get back from GitHub. And this is the JSON from GitHub, which is now ready to be used by the React component. So what should I do with this information instead of just logging it? I can't change the constructor from here. I'm stuck into the line 19. I'm stuck inside the callback I gave to uh, 10. I need to change the state in here. I need to change my component state. The way we change the component state in React is not by doing this dot state equals something. You can't do that. You have to do set state. And here you pass a JSON with the keys you want to update in the state. You don't have to pass the whole keys because state may have many keys. You just pass the one you want to change. So here we want to change flats. And what do we assign it to? The data we got. OK, the data we got is an array of flats, the one I just displayed on the left. OK, so we just assign the data. And now if I save again, you see, I get the flats from the JSON. OK, I just touch the state, and React automatically uh, understands that the state changed and will render again the component. OK? That's, I mean, that's where things start to become really cool. OK? So we have, we have this state. When we load the page, we get information from a JSON, from an API. It gets us some JSON, and you give this to React, and React will render the components automatically for you. OK? Um, so let's do the map. And the map actually may be scary, because it's like uh, Google Maps. You have to understand a new library, go and fetch information. Actually, it's kind of easy. Why is it so easy? Because basically, when you do React, you realize that a bunch of developers created components like you, like what we, we just did, and they open sourced the components, meaning that you can plug these components, put them right into your project, and use them. And now that React is really, really popular, there are many, many components for many, many usages. And for instance, if you just type Google Map React in Google, this is the first result you get, which is a repository on GitHub, which has more than 2,000 stars, which means that it's quite used. And you can just go and use this one. So how do we add a new external component to our project? Because I, obviously, I don't want to create the Google Map component myself. Okay? So the way you do that, you go to this kind of documentation, and usually they say, um, OK, this is how you add the, um, the, the element to the, to the project. Here I'm going to use yarn, which uh, is not NPM, but looks like it. So we just do yarn add and the name of the component we want to add. So it will fetch it from the internet, install it in my project, and list it as a dependency. If you look at the package.json file, you see now that I get a new dependency. You see line six? Now I rely on Google Map React. I rely on React, React DOM, and React Scripts, plus this one. Cool. So now I'm ready to use this component. So nice. Let's have a look at the documentation quickly. So the way they use it in the readme is basically you, you import the, the component the same way that we actually import uh, our own components. And then you can run this. So you run the component Google Map React with some props, a center and a zoom. And inside the component, you will add your markers. So for now, let's just uh, put a map of Paris okay, with no markers. So let's import Google Map React. I will do it right away in the app. Okay, it's, it's kind of tiny. I don't want to create an external file for that. I'm fine uh, inside this one. So import this. Then 
use inside my map Uh, so let's close the tag. I mean, here I will put the markers later on inside the tags. And actually, so uh, for the center and the zoom, so the zoom could be 11. The zoom is a number between 1 and 15. And it's for Google to know how much to zoom on a map. Okay? So 11 is kind of nice. And I, I saw that this afternoon, but the documentation is not uh, up to date. It should be zoom and center, actually. So center will be a variable which contains a latitude and a longitude. That's how you tell the component where to center the map. So you need to say, we center it at this point, and this is the level of zoom. And that's enough for the component to render. Do you know the coordinates of Paris? It's like 42 and 2, or 48 and 2. So let's put these ones. Thanks to Google. Okay, and now, uh, so center is defined. Uh, sorry, I put the center outside the render method. Okay, so I have the center. I have my external component with the center set to Paris, the zoom 11, and the map displays. Okay, and it's really nice because You see, I mean, I didn't put a lot of effort into doing it. I, I didn't even go to the Google documentation. I just used the component I found. And we're happy it's working, actually, because sometimes you find an open source uh, component which is not working. Anyway, uh, so here, if I change the zoom I, and I set 9, I will get a bird eye view of um, the Paris area. And if I do, I don't know, like 14, I will get uh, centered on the center of Paris. Okay? That's how I can play with the map. But again, it's all React. It's all about importing a component that somebody coded for me and use it passing props. I just pass props and it works. Okay? So let's add some markers. Okay, not so easy. How can I add some markers? Remember, if we go back to the slides, we said in our Uh, presentation that basically we need the app, the flat, the map, and the markers. So, we create a new component, marker.js, and a new CSS file for the markers, okay, because uh, we are going to need a few lines of CSS. So, let's open the file. For the JS, again, um, we start like usual. Okay, and we export this. So, what should be the marker? So, we can assume that the marker will get a flat. Okay, the same way that we passed a flat to the flat component. So, we know that basically, uh, no, sorry, we know, we know we get a uh, JSON which looks like that. And thanks to LAT and, and LNG passed automatically uh, by uh, the component, uh, we should be able to build a marker which displays on the map. So basically what we just need to implement is something which looks like that, where we pass a latitude, a longitude, and some text. And latitude and longitude is something that is going to be used internally by the component, and the text is something we want to display. So we, as, let's assume we are passing uh, the information about the flat. So what information do we want to display as a marker on the map? What Airbnb, Airbnb is doing? Price. The price, okay, so that's the price. Cool, so let's assume that we get a div. Ah, so sorry, we return a div. Containing the price. So I would assume that I get, I get some text, actually. This is my marker. So how, how can, I, can I use the marker now? 
Where should I instantiate the markers? In the app, yeah, within the map. Here, in the Google Map React, I'm going to do the same that, as I did for the flats. I'm going to iterate over every flat, but instead of rendering the component flat, which, which component should I render? The marker, okay? And I need to render the marker passing a latitude, a longitude, and some text, and the text will be the price. Am I done? I get an error? Yeah, yeah I get an error because marker is not defined. Again, some <coughs> when you want to use a component first, you need to import it. Okay, and now if we go back, uh, if we unzoom, yeah, I have stuff in Montmartre. So you see, we have the, the prices showing up. Not really satisfying, but at least it's working. What am I missing? Some CSS, obviously. So for the marker, I put up a marker class on the marker, so I can just say, let's put a width of 48 <coughs> pixels, for instance, some background color, white, some border, uh, with some gray, and some border radius, two pixels. Something like that and centering the element as well. Uh, is it working? No, it's not working because my CSS is not imported into my component. Okay, so now the component, oh, it's annoying, it's, yeah. Okay, cool, it's working. Uh, let's zoom a bit out, 11 is fine. Okay, so we have the markers. Maybe some padding, uh, I don't know, like four pixels on top, and the border radius could be a bit higher. Yeah. Okay. Again, my job is not to design stuff at Le Wagon, hopefully. <laughs> anyway, at least, yeah, I mean, we could have something a bit bigger. I don't know. 18 pixels, maybe? No, it's not font white, it's uh, font size. Okay, are you satisfied? Yeah, that's fine, okay. If you're not, you can come over here. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so, almost, uh, almost finished. What are we missing? Uh, yeah, yeah. We can pass the currency. I mean, the currency would be kind of ugly if we, I mean, Let's do that, okay? Let's say we just have euros, I mean. <laughs> anyway, we should pass information as props, et cetera, et cetera. You, you know the drill now. Okay, so map and markers are done. So now, something that we have not covered and that will be the last aspect of React that we need to cover is basically events. So what should happen, in your opinion, whenever I click on a flat? Yeah, I want to highlight a marker, first thing, and then what else? Center the map on this marker. Okay, that's two stuff I need to do. Cool. So first we need to, to learn, or before we do that, maybe in the flat.css, I can do, uh, I can show to the user that you can actually click on the div with a cursor pointer. And what I can do is have a nice uh, hover effect with some opacity when I hover the flat. This way, you see when you hover, you kind of feel it like it's selected and with the, the pointer, you know that you can click on it. Okay, so I'm clicking on, on this and I, I want to react to the, to the click. Okay, and it's not reacting yet. So how do we do that? Uh, yeah, I we have a, an ugly warning. I, I can talk about that before we do the event. When you do a loop, when you do a, an iteration like that, you have to pass a key to React. This way, it understands whenever you, you switch positions, when you insert an element, etc. it's for optimization reasons. That's why you get a warning and not an error. And usually what you do is pass the ID of the element you have 
But here, I don't have an ID on my element. I just have a name. So we just pass the name as a key. And doing that, you get rid. Sorry. Uh, just the render method in the app. Uh, yeah, you need to do that as well for here. Yeah, OK, you get rid of the warning. Cool. So I told you I want to react to the fact that I click on a flat. Cool. So if we go back to the flag.js, the way you react on an event is adding a property to, a, to an element. And this is kind of like old school JavaScript. Maybe you did like HTML 20 years ago, and the way you attached events to HTML was like that. So it's kind of a comeback. That's how they do that in React. And basically here, what should be the type of the callback of onClick? What should we pass uh, as onClick? We should pass a, a function in here. Should be a function. So here, we know that we need to pass a function. Cool. So first, we need to understand where should we define the function, and what should it do, and what information does it need to do its job. So right now, I mean, inside the flat, we said that basically, when we uh, click on a, on a flat, we zoom, uh, sorry, we center the map on the flat, and we change the marker uh, CSS so that it's selected. So do we have all this information about the map inside the flat? Not really. OK, it's contained. I mean, the flat just knows about itself. It does not know anything about the external world. This means that we create a flat. When you create a flat, you need to pass a function which will be the function called by the component whenever it gets clicks, clicked on. This is like the trickiest part of the presentation, I think. So basically here, we will call the handle click method that we get passed as a prop from our parent. And you see that props, right now, we used it to pass data, strings, numbers, etc. You can also pass functions. So we use function, and here, I, you, you see, I'm not doing handle click parentheses. I am not calling the method. I am giving the method as an argument to the onClick uh, uh, props. So when we instantiate the flat, we pass a key, we pass a flat, and we also pass the onClick method. And what is it? That's something we need to create, right? So here, I create a select flag function, like that. And the select flat will take a flat and change the state. Before we actually do stuff, let's log and make sure that everything is wired. Right now, it's not completely wired, because you see that select flat expects that you are passing a flat. But here, I'm not doing that. I'm calling handle click without anything. So we need an intermediate state. Like that. So we define a handle click on the component. And here, we are going to call the handle click method from the props, passing the flat. So actually, we can rename stuff. So select flat could be passed as a select flat props from the app, which means that here we are going to call the select flat method. So what we do here is call the parent method select flat. So app is giving a function to the child flat, and flat calls this parent function when the click event happens. And we need to do that because the flat component does not know about the external world. So it will just act as a proxy saying, hey, I got clicked. Do something. And passing the flat which got clicked on. And that's what we're going to do in the app. The app is a bit like the God object knowing about everything 
and that's where you can handle the event. So what should we do in the select flat? We got a flat, it's got just selected. What could we do? Yeah, basically we need to re-render the map. We need to re-render the map because we need to change the markers and we need to change the position of the map. So we need to change the state. Because when you, whenever you say, I need to re-render, you don't control the rendering. That's React's job. But you control the state. And whenever you touch the state, React uh, actually reacts to the state change. So here, I need to extend my state. And instead of just storing a list of flats, I will store a selected flat key. And selected flat will start at what? Nothing. <coughs> OK, I don't have anything selected when I start my application, when I load the page. Cool. So now I can call the this dot set state selected flat and assigning the flat that the, chi the child passed to me. So let's log stuff as well because I'm going a bit, a bit fast. So if we, if we click, you see, whenever I click, I get a log that the flat has been clicked. So everything is wired, everything is working. How can I change the render method so that, so that it actually does something? You see, if I, if I zoom in a bit, 13, if I click on the flat right now, it's not doing anything. So, what should I change in the render method? Center. Yeah, the center. Right now, the center is a constant. It should not be. How can I change the center? Basically, if there is a selected flat, what should be the center? Yeah, the coordinates of the flat. So this dot state dot selected flat dot lat. Okay, I change the center based on my state. Let's go back to the Chrome. If we click on it, sorry, mm -hmm. selected typo. Okay, so I click on the flat again. Uh, selected flat, thank you. Okay, so I click on the first one and we moved. Second one, we moved. This one, we moved at the south of Paris. Okay, it's working. And you see, again, I didn't touch any HTML, I didn't touch any CSS, I didn't try to, to touch my DOM, etc. It just, it's just a matter of changing my state and the render method is called automatically by React and React does the heavy lifting of ch changing stuff on the UI. And that's where React is really, really powerful. We're not done. The marker that we selected is not selected. So how can we have this concept of marker selection? If we take the marker, marker.js, Basically, we need a class. Let's say a selected class on the marker. And we can say, OK, the background color will be yellow. And the uh, border mm, color will be black. Um, the problem, z-index, something that we could have, like basically you put it over, but it won't work because it's inside a div that you don't control. So if you wanted to do the z-index part, it would be a bit trickier. So I won't cover it tonight. But you're right, that's something we should take into account as well. So here, you see the class name is marker, but we want it to be selected as well. But if I do that, like that, well, everything is selected. Okay? So what should I do? Basically, 
let's extract this to uh, variable and let's have some condition. And basically, if I get from the props that I'm selected, what should I do? I should add the selected class. So now our job is to pass the classes boolean to the marker. You see right now it's still working, but all my markers are white. So if we go back to the app, the app.js, inside the marker, so we passed the key, we passed the latitude, we passed the longitude, we passed the text. What should we pass? Selected. And what will be the value of selected? So if I pass true, everyone is selected. So not true. So the flat is equal to what? Yeah, the selected flat from the state. OK? Now this way, only one flat is selected. OK? And again, it's not about using add classes or, or manipulation of the DOM. It's just about changing the state. And the render method gets called automatically by React. That's really the, t the key takeaway of tonight. Um, do you have some, some courage again to this? <laughs> and it's like the very last one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, five, five minutes. We want to add search. And the way we add search is add an input, which basically every time you type a key in the input, you will change the state. And you will change the list of flats you want to display. So that's how we are going to use it. We are going to put a nice input as, as a search in uh, this, like that. So if we go back, you should see an input. This is my input. Let's put some style because it's kind of ugly. Um, so in the app.css for the search input, we could have a width of 100%, uh, height of 40 pixels, font size of 24 pixel, color could be gray, almost there, um, some margin. Actually, we can put the, the padding on search. So 10 pixels on the search and some margin uh, on the right. OK, so now I have my search and some padding inside the input. OK, so whenever I type, you see, some method gets called. Which one? Basically, handle search. Search comes from the state. So when I type on the input, I should change the search. So search, when you start, is empty. And handle search will be an event that gets logged every time you type a key. So I just, let's look at the console. You see, every time I type a key, a new event gets logged. So I want to take this information and change the state of the search where I will get the value. And this way, I just re-implemented the <coughs> fact that I'm keeping um, the, the content of, of the input. Sorry. Uh, input element should not switch from control to uncontrolled or vice versa. Uh, what did I miss? Uh, flat. Even that value. Uh, well, anyway, let's let's stick this warning and, and we'll fix it later. So, what should we what do we want to do every time we we, t we we search? What should happen on the list of flats? Yeah, you you want to filter. You want to change the flat. So if I type 
trendy, for instance. I want to just show up the flats which contain trendy in the name. Okay, so how do I do that? I need to change the flat, right? So here, if I set flat equal empty array, when I type a letter, everything goes away. So that's not really what I want to do. So what do I want to do? Uh, where's the zoom? So what I want to do is actually taking my flats and filtering them based on the match on the name. That's one way of doing it. So the thing is that I could take the current state of the flats and filter them based on whatever uh, like value I find. So I could create a new uh, regular expression and exec this regular expression on the flat. And doing that, basically I'm saying, OK, if the flat matches my search, fine, let's keep it in the list. The thing is that if you remove your search, you destroyed the previous flat. Look, I mean, it yeah, it's not working at all. Um, Maybe I should fix this error because... Um, so I will cheat a bit. I will go back to my previous implementation, which is working. Uh, on my repo, sorry for that. So up the JS, I have my handle search somewhere. So it's even the target that value. Mm. Yeah, nice. So. So now nothing is filtered, <laughs> but at least I, I still have my flats, <laughs> which is cool. Uh, so let's run a debugger. Okay, this way you will have seen how we debug a React app. So debugger is something which will stop the code inside my browser as soon as the code hits this line. So if I click on T, now I'm I'm paused in the debugger. So you see, um, JavaScript is, is is paused. I'm here and I can inspect the, the, the stuff I have. So here, normally I should be able to call this.state.flats. The problem is that this.state is kind of not available. It's kind of weird. I think it's a Webpack problem with the React app. So if you call underscore this on this very version, you get access to your this. So this.state is an object which contains flats. And I could filter based on whatever rule I want. And actually, I see my error here. It's even that value. It should be what? Yeah, I missed this. OK, so let's remove my debugger, reload the page, and try the search again. Nice. So yeah, OK, if I go back, I don't have my flats anymore. So how can I go get my flats again when I go back? And actually, here it should be flat.name, by the way. <laughs> so you see, trendy, I get all my trendy flats. But I w when I go away, I don't get my flat flats back. How can I fix that? Uh, Sorry? The thing is that I'm destroying this.state.flats. Because every time I call this.state, this.set state on the flats, I override the previous value. So I started with six flats, I type some keywords, and the result of the, of the search is just two flats, and I override the six flats, so I lost them. So how could, could I keep them? So here, it's kind of a tweak, because normally, every time we type a keyword, what should happen is a call to the API, 
and the API will give you the list of flats. Meaning that if you do a keystroke backspace to remove, a new API call will, will be run and you get a fresh list of flats. So you won't get this situation. But here, we are just faking the API parts. So the way we can do that is this. Basically, you will duplicate the list of flats. You have the all flats and the flats. All flats never change. It's always the list of flats. And the flat is the filter. So here, when you receive the data from the JSON, you just store it again okay, at two positions. And here, instead of using this.state.flats, what do you use? All flats. Okay, and this one never changes. So you're fine. Cool. So we reload, trendy, and we get byte our flight. Okay? And you see on the map, the search happens. You see? It gets filtered as well, which is really, really cool. And you see it's really fast as well. So again, I just had to change the state. And all my code is rendered again because React understands that the state changes, so you need to re-render the components. Okay? And yeah, basically that's it for, for tonight. So if you want to go further, um, there are two great uh, lecture, uh, sorry, two great courses on the internet because I mean it was like a really fast overview of what you can do with React. We have, uh, you have React for Beginners. Maybe you know about this one. Uh, it's from Westboss. Uh, Westboss is a web developer who's doing like, great tutorials on the web. Uh, it's in English. And on Udemy, you have um, his, I uh, don't remember his name, yeah, uh, Steven Grider, who's doing modern React with Redux. So Redux is something I did not cover tonight, but it's something which helps you dealing with basically the back end on the front end side, the way you handle data in React and in front-end code. So that's two great courses if you are into online courses. And also as well, we have our own five days uh, training at Le Wagon. That's a new program we launched uh, three weeks ago. So maybe you know Le Wagon is all about a nine weeks coding bootcamp, starting from zero. And in the end, you manage to build great uh, Ruby on Rails application and great prototypes for startups. So here, it's not really nine weeks, it's five days. Okay, so it's more suited for people who actually have a work uh, and a, a job. And basically, we, we, we cover React, we cover Redux, which is uh, really uh, helpful when you do React. And we see in the end how we integrate that into Rails. So check it out if you, if you want as well. And I, I will be happy to have you as students uh, maybe, maybe later. Thank you for tonight. And you can come and ask questions. <laughs>